Oh, yeah, yeah my district, District 2, is uh, uh, in the north part of the county, but uh, it's a big district. It's the largest district, and uh, it's in size-wise, but it's also got the biggest number of people, uh, 83,000 people, and it goes to the Santa Cruz County line uh, at the Powell Road River uh, at Watsonville, and then we have a whole bunch of individual communities. Uh, unlike other districts, we don't have a municipality here in no cities, so er everything is some towns that uh, are spread around considerably. Uh, Moss Landing, Casterville, Prunedale, uh, uh, Pajaro, uh, Las Lomas, uh, Wilson Knowles, to, to name a few. Uh, and each one has some individual uh, problems and issues, and uh, so it, it, it's a big, vast community. It's, it's got uh, land, but it also, we're in the coastal area. We have Moss Landing that has Imbari and the Moss Landing Rain Laboratory. We have the Elkhorn Slough <laughs> that so many know us by. Uh, so it, it's, uh, it's uh, and then it wraps around, I represent part of Salinas, even the downtown um, uh, train stations in my district just by a sliver. And then I wrap around and Rancho Cielo is, uh, I used to run, is uh, part of my district. So it, it, it's an expansive district, a lot of diverse issues. Uh, the, the old power plant, everybody recognizes the old power plant that's basically out of operation, but that'll set to be the home of the largest battery uh, storage facility in the world. Uh, the largest one right now is in Perth, Australia, uh, and, and uh, that will be the largest. Uh, uh, they'll invest 300 million in, in battery storage uh, there at the Moss Landing uh, Vistra uh, at the Moss Landing uh, power plant. I think agriculture in this area uh, is, is still king you know, by far, but um, some of the other economic drivers that there at Moss Landing uh, is becoming bigger and bigger, and construction is, is getting bigger, but uh, we're, we're hampered by how much construction we can do with, with uh, water shortage and seawater sea intrusion and the moratorium on building in areas in Prunedale. So, um, but I, I think uh, agriculture is still the dominant uh, economic driver. Not all of it, but certainly in the area here in Casterville area, uh, most of the most of the land around here you see is under purple pipe, uh, CSIP, uh, and that's all people don't realize that that's all water that's being recycled and being brought uh, into the area. And so, yeah, uh, seawater intrusion, especially here in the Prunedale area, we're dealing not so much with seawater intrusion, but just uh, people making sure their water is safe and is passing the test with the more stringent tests and that's why we're doing a point of use point of entry uh, system to help alleviate some of that concern but water issues seawater intrusion and other water issues are major issues that need to be built, dealt with in North County. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we're, here, gonna, you going to? we're gonna be doing the same thing here they have a fund they have a, a setup and we can go ahead and uh, Walk there, but we just uh, start putting uh, the set up all the sprinkles here, and we all just right. start moving plants here just uh, a couple weeks ago. Moving, right. uh, <laughs> and the floor there is the bigger size, the fives and fifteens, and this is gallons, and that's going to be two gallons. Yeah, uh, it, it, everything's uh, designed so that you. Save labor. Save labor. Well. labor. I told people about your place, your house, which I think is the most beautifully landscaped place I've seen, but how you designed that water system so all the water that you, all the irrigation you do goes and gets collected in the pond and then recycled even at your house and uh, yeah, I got the uh, water reuse. I'd be able to collect uh, about 17,000 gallons of water 
at my house with a recycle that I put there. When I'm water and when it rains, and I use it back into the garden. And uh, we do the same thing at Monterey Bay Nursery. Uh, we recycle about 80% of the water. I remember uh, saying, well, yeah, but you got to pump it back up the hill. And you say, yeah, but that's a lot cheaper than pumping it from 200 feet down to the ground. Yeah, well, that is <laughs> that's true right. because Which it's, it's easy, easier to pull it from, uh, you know, 10 feet from the reservoir than 200, 300 feet under the, yeah. 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 All right. So, yeah. And it's uh, one of the drought taller plants, even uh, more drought taller than California natives. You can throw this plant away in the ground and let it sit there for six months, come back and pick it up and water and uh, start uh, growing again. How often do you water them? This we water about every two weeks. And during the summer and the winter time, we probably once a month, every six weeks, depends the the weather. Okay, yes. and uh, all the all plastic the pipe uh, that 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 looks the, like all that's new. Yeah, the sprinkles, all the sprinkles we put in new, just to try to save uh, uh, labor, because uh, you know the labor is short uh, in this area, so uh, we're trying to save. Uh, so. How does the piping and the and the sprinkler system that you put in? How does that save you labor? Uh, that's because uh, water by hand is going to take uh, about a day's time to water this greenhouse, and this uh, is going to take uh, about twenty minutes. <laughs> okay. In the north of Monterey County, to recycle water, I think we've been doing it almost. Uh, 26 years before anybody started. And the purpose of do, doing that, that was because uh, we can use the water back into the plants and instead of letting it run. Wasn't even an environmental thing. We just know that we need the water. <laughs> so that's what we did it. Later they come up with all these things and I'm already set up. Yeah, you you, you, yeah. you were recycling water well before any of the rest of us ever thought yeah. about it, or, or the government thought about it. it. Just makes and it makes complete sense. Uh, uh, well, the reason is you see too much water running off and say, "What, well, what's that water going for? I can use it back." Yeah. Yeah. So that's what we did. Yeah. yeah, we we've been doing it for a long time. family was in the movie business. My my dad was a key grip. My uncle was a key grip. All my cousins worked in the business. So I I started working at 17 in the movie business, and that's how I worked my way through college and, and law school. I think I took a $400 a month cut to go practice law up in Oakland, uh, where I started practicing law uh, fr from working at the studio. So went up, practiced law in Oakland for a year and a half, and when I got out of the Army, I was in the Army Reserves, and when I got out of the Army, I went to, lived in Australia, New Zealand, and New Guinea, and some places for a year traveling, and uh, came back. And the DA's office got some vacancies, and so I went down and interviewed and got a job. And yeah, I started as a deputy DA, and then I became the assistant. And then um, I was uh, appointed to the bench in 19... 84 by Governor Duke Mason. Roll call, please. And uh, Mr. Baum, will you lead us in the budget, please? It was something I never thought I would do. I mean, run for a, a, an office. I'm, I main reason I run is. Um, a number of people came to me and uh, knew Lou was, uh, Cal Kegna was stepping down. And so when he was asking me to step up, um, and this is my community where I've lived for 48, 49 years, raised our kids, my, one of my kids teach here are in, in the system. Um, I felt I kind of had an obligation um, uh, to step up. Interesting enough, when, uh, when my, um, we had walkers when I ran the first time, and everybody, a lot of people encouraged me to run because they assumed I had a lot of name recognition, and 
um, with my years in, in, in the legal business. And um, turns out people didn't know me very well. And so I think we had like 11% recognition. And then as an afterthought, they said, well, he's the guy that started Rancho Cielo. And my name recognition jumped up to about 87%, you know, which was interesting phenomena, you know, that, that you spend your whole life working in a legal thing, but people know you best by uh, creating this uh, non nonprofit. Rancho Cielo is kind of a special place. I don't think there's anything quite like it. Uh, it, it was a, a, a great community project where the whole community got involved and my, my own feasibility study said it was impossible that we could never do it and that's when we really got everybody rolling and, and rolled up our sleeves and said we're not going to fail at this and, it, and it's, uh, so that's when I, why I retired when I did. Um, the, the ranch opened. When I wasn't presiding judge, I would be uh, trying all the heavy criminal cases. And unfortunately, the heavy criminal cases, when I first got here, the juveniles, you never saw a kid with a gun. Well, you, now you saw the kids committing these pretty serious crimes. And my job was to determine how long they went to prison for. So I'm, I'm sending 16, 17-year-old kids to prison. My job is whether it's 44 years to life or 56 years to life, that's my job. And so you, you just see this wasted youth um, because we're not reaching them soon enough and they're caught between two cultures and, um, they're, and as soon as they pull the trigger, whether they hit anybody or not, it's, 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 you know, it's almost too late. And so it, it, you weren't feeling good about your job you're not making a positive impact other than just, and the, the legislature at that time was, well, everybody's gonna feel safer if we just keep locking people up for a longer length of time. And then you realize we're, we're locking up our workforce and it's gonna cost us $75,000 a year at, at the minimum to keep our workforce locked up if we get in and do something sooner. And the one thing that I saw that turned kids around is the kids that didn't have any hope for the future, that didn't ever think they could do anything, had no self-esteem, when you gave them the tools that, yeah, you can get through here, you can get through high school, you can get ready and get a job, and you can start earning money, and you can start buying a pickup truck and doing all the other things that, that the rest of us do, you know, and so that's why uh, Rancho Cielo has that a big push on on the job component, you know, of we're going to get you a job, and that's that was the big part of it. We can make a commitment to the kids if you go through this and you get a high school diploma and you do and you work on your other issues you have, and I'll, I'll get you a job. <laughs> and and I had a, a connections to the community that that I could. And it's unique in the sense that it's a, an unmatched in other places because it's a public-private partnership. But then we work with probation department and we work with county education and we, we work with behavioral health. I, I don't start a program without some psychiatric social workers because a lot of these young people have issues that need to be dealt with uh, so that they're prepared to go out to life uh, in the right way. So a public-private partnership like this is, is very unusual. The other thing I think is a unique about Rancho is it, it's one of those nonprofits that's been able to garner support from all over the community. But here we have the support of the ag community and things and up here in the north of the community and the oil people down south in the community and we, we have support from just about everybody involved. You know, like I said, we don't have um, any cities were, were things. So, so everything, all the benefits and services that are provided come from the county for these people. So, I mean, um, issues of infrastructure, uh, adequate infrastructure form, adequate water, 
uh, uh, roads. I mean, that's a major concern uh, is the condition of the roads and how much it's, it's a lot better since we passed uh, Measure X uh, and uh, SB1, but uh, infrastructure and roads is a dominant thing. And from the standpoint of my constituents, uh, uh, my office is their only voice to county government. And, and so it, it, these people are paying taxes. You're the county government. Uh, and you're the only conduit they have to try to make changes that are needed for county government. And uh, we, we set up town hall meetings in each one of the in Bolsa Knowles, uh, Prunedale, uh, Casterville, Moss Landing. I've had town hall meetings in every one of those. And then what I try to do is get a group of people together uh, who are um, uh, interested in the community that are willing to make the time commitment and uh, maybe seven or eight of them getting them together from time to time so you can see what issues that particular community is facing. And plus, uh, my office spends a lot of time and people calling and have a concern. We get their concern to the whatever county agency is, is concerned about it and make sure that the county agency follows up on it. But then we also set up meetings where they come in and see me. I, I have probably meet with constituents probably 20 constituents a week who are here and concerned about something and uh, want to have a meeting with either a member of my staff to bring it to their attention or with me personally. We're here in Moss Landing with Kim Solano. Uh, uh, she's helped build this, uh, she and her family have helped build Moss Landing to what it is today and uh, Eric Tynan is the uh, uh, water sewer man for Casterville and also does the sewer here in. in Moss Landing, uh, but we like to get together and talk about the issues so that I know the issues that my district is facing and each town facing a little bit. So Moss Landing is uh, a, a place like there is no other place like this. Uh, it's a really uh, special place. You, a lot of changes. Uh, you work here, but you also live here. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's right. My father as well. My husband and I all live and work here and uh, we feel a really tremendous responsibility. My father always has and he taught me that. I, I, I learned that from him and my mom to, uh, you know, our community is, is the heart and soul of, of who we are. And, and I think Moss Landing has so, so much to offer and, and it's important that we you know, that we embrace the growth, but in a, in a responsible way, of course, right? We'd love to get underground root utilities sooner than later as part of our, you know, upgraded situation would be nice. Uh, Eric, you do a lot for the community, especially in Casterville. Eric's the guy that I go to when uh, I need to know what's going on in Casterville and what are the problems and what are the things we have to focus on, so. Well, Casterville's the second oldest community in Monterey County, and. The challenge is it's bisected by two freeways. It's a little, but uh, it's close to Moss Landing, so we get a lot of people from the Marine Labs who live there, and uh, a lot of farm workers. It's got a housing problem. You know, it's not enough housing for as many people, but uh, I guess uh, affordable housing is building those two complexes, 50, 70 units, so that'll help. Looking but, at uh, it. No, it's been, we've been real lucky to have the supervisor's office right there in town. Like yeah. Kim, I live in yeah. Casterville, 100, 150 feet from my office. so. <laughs> And yeah, Eric doesn't have any trouble uh, banging on my door to let me know what uh, 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 s some of the issues are. But Doors yeah, open. <laughs> Ca Casterville, I, I was going uh, uh, into Monterey on Sunday and uh, when we came back, uh, the highway was blocked up, one was blocked up and 156 was blocked up. Casterville is uh, landlocked on a, on a Sunday afternoon. We're, hold, we're held yeah. hostage really. Yeah. If we want to yeah. do anything, forget about it. When we did the Salinas Interchange, uh, and we're looking about everybody taking the Salinas Interchange over to San Miguel to 101, and there's 28,000 cars to take that. And everybody is taking that, and that's become the main route. They don't come down to Dolan because there's so much traffic here, and so it pushes much more traffic that way. It's something we gotta look at. We got the mayor of, uh, come over here, mayor. 
bike to Josh. Come on. jobs I've had before where I made all the decisions. I mean, as a judge, you make the final decision. As, a, as a, I ran the DA's office, you know, for a lot of years, I made the final decision. So this is a, 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 a takes some adjustment of saying that uh, I don't have any decision-making power until I have two other supervisors working with me to do it. So it's, it's a different way of making uh, decisions. I, um, I think I'm much per better prepared to represent uh, the second district uh, this this time around than the first time around. Everybody assumed, well, you know everything that's going around here. You worked for the, you started working for in county government in 1971. You've had diversity. You've lived here in the area. And uh, having said that, there is a lot to learn in this job. And anybody that tells you, well, uh, I'll learn everything there is to know in three months or four months. Um, they don't know what they're talking about. I mean, exception may be Chris Lopez, who, you know, worked with and under Simone Salinas for, for uh, a long time and can come up running. But the rest of us, it takes you a good eight months, nine months, a year to really understand. I mean, uh, not just this job, but all the other things you're on, AMBAG and FORA and uh, the Salinas Valley Solid Waste and TAMSI and it's a waste to, to actually learn the job so you, you can really be productive at it and then quit after four years and that was one of the reasons I, that I chose to uh, run again was I, I thought I knew a lot more about how to get things done and, and, and could do a better job of representing my, uh, with the experience I had after four years. Good morning, Supervisor Phillips. Thanks for coming out to Animal Services today. Thank you for having me. Well, today's a great opportunity to talk about some of the cool things that are happening at Animal Services. Um, we're actively redoing our dog play yards, which is great. We've got, we're going from a gravel base to getting artificial turf um, put in with the assistance of uh, volunteers including yourself so thank you for that this past weekend uh, we had a really great workshop on high energy dogs we've been seeing about a 200 percent increase in husky dogs over the last probably two to three years that, that surprised me too uh, that you, I see so many uh, husky dogs here you know it's something that it, what started as a trend uh, we started seeing more and more and more whereas we'd get maybe one husky in a month to where it became one a week. And a couple, well, probably two months ago, there was 13 Huskies between the two shelters here on Hitchcock Road. We wanted an opportunity to educate the public. So we turned it into a collaborative um, workshop on high energy dogs because Huskies are not alone. We you know, see a lot of shepherds and Labradors and pit bulls that are high energy. And that was um, in conjunction with From the Heart Dog Training, the SPCA, Family Dog Rescue, up actually in San Francisco, they, they helped us create the, the content for the workshop, so it was a nice collaboration. Well, Animal Control provides services for uh, not only the animals that come into the facility, but we also go out into the community and enforce laws. And so that's kind of more of the mandated area that, that we work on. You know, you have a, see a dog running loose or, or you get bit or you go to the hospital. So an Animal Control Officer is gonna be who responds to that. You, you've taken it to the next step of getting the merger and eventually be having a countywide um, animal control. Each smaller town having their own animal control, it makes sense that we have a regional approach. So I was using this and told them how long it took us to even get where we are today. Anytime you're talking about two different entities and the enemies coming together, um, uh, trying to work out all the logistics of that is, is more challenging than you thought and I thought, but it, it, it's, it's, it's clearly the right approach. The county does have the, the support services that, that can be used to, to help in that, um, but I think this building is a good base to build off of uh, to make things bigger and, and to expand, and, and it can expand into some of the counties you mentioned, South County, uh, especially as far as creating kind of a hub to provide animal services more regionally. And I know you've been developing this, Salinas is stronger than we are with the volunteer program, and I know that's a big part of what you've been doing. We let our volunteer program 
dwindled down here is non-existent, and I know you rely heavily on volunteers, or sh should, and that be a, a, a big, big need there. Our, our program is getting up and running. Uh, we've um, we've got a, a volunteer in place, and we've just you know gotten approval to hire a full-time volunteer coordinator to share with the city. But we've got we've got a lot of, of a lot of things that we're going to do with volunteers, helping us in our own spay neuter clinic, helping us feeding dogs and getting dogs out and going to off-site events in the community and helping with our community cats program. So I'm confident that in, in six months from now, if we sat down, that we'd have a we'd have a much different picture and have a lot more going on. Um, I, I do think uh, this is a kind of hidden gem of not enough people. Know, they know about the SPCA, not enough people know about us. I'd like to see us eventually have a, a mobile unit that goes out into the community um, uh, like SNP bus does and, and goes out there and, and the, you know goes to Soledad one week and goes to Casterville the next week and, and, and provides services out there. So. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, spay and neuter bringing the spay and neuter needs to the to the public is is huge. You'll get the people that won't make you know won't call or bring their animals in or aren't able to based on their location. Right. And so, spaying and neutering is definitely a key tool to have in our pocket. I I, I see when they have the event out in Casterville and some other places, uh, the number uh, the, there's much more demand. There is uh, uh, ability to deal with it. So yes, absolutely. It's big. So. What do we need to do to, to, to get the community more involved in our program? And, uh, uh, what, what are the steps we need to take before we uh, really reach out to the community? Be able to go out and offer events, invite the public in, um, and actually, and then increase our volunteer program. That, that's our best word of yeah. mouth right there is volunteers. Uh, that'll all start to happen. But I don't think I was ever out to the shelter until I became a supervisor. Um, and a lot of other people haven't been. They go to the SBCA, but they haven't been here. You ask them about it. Where are our shelters? They don't know. we got to fix that. We absolutely need to fix that. Yeah, Hitchcock Road should be the first thing on, right, the, right. on the tip of their tongue. I think the job is interesting. It's also frustrating. Uh, job because you there are things that you'd like to see get done sooner uh, it's frustrated that uh, our, our county and and with no fault but we don't have a, enough financial resources to take care of all the things that that that, you, that I would like to see and my constituents would like to see you can stay in touch with your constituents you, you do the best you can when you're going through the government process but that's that's what what it takes we are hereby adjourned. Thank you. <laughs> I was waiting for practice. <laughs>